Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. It's 1215 and uh, it is my supreme pleasure to welcome you all to uh, our continued celebration of uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. My name is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judge Dean Lum. I'm the chair of the Education Committee uh, for the Superior Court. Uh, and we have a really special presentation today. This is the second in three of our uh, AAPI Heritage Month celebration events. Um, uh, yesterday, many of you were able to see our panel discussion uh, put on by the Courts and Community uh, Committee. Uh, and uh, the discussion yesterday was, uh, where are you really from? Uh, it was a hard-hitting panel by, uh, an ex uh, by several uh, extremely uh, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, and we have a second part today, uh, our book discussion on uh, the New York Times bestseller, The Hotel uh, at the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. And it's our extreme pleasure to have with us the author, uh, Jamie Ford, uh, and also who will be interviewed by uh, Commissioner Jonathan Lack of our court. So today is our the second leg of our three-part series. And the, the third part, uh, we're excited to present uh, next Thursday, June 3. And uh, you've received the flyers already. Uh, there's a virtual tour uh, of, of the sites and uh, um, some of the uh, uh, places that are depicted uh, in the book, uh, Henry's apartment, you can see a lot of other uh, places around the Panama Hotel and a number of other places that are described in the book. Uh, that is uh, sponsored by the Wing Luke uh, Museum. Uh, and for those of you who haven't been to the Wing Luke before, uh, we encourage you to go down there, but you'll be able to view these events from the, from the comfort of your own computer screen next Thursday. And so we really encourage you to log on uh, at 1215 next Thursday for uh, what promises to be a really exciting event. But back to today, uh, we are so pleased uh, to have uh, Jamie Ford with us today. I have to say, as somebody who grew up in Seattle, uh, when I, I read his book, it was so pitch perfect for so many different reasons. Of course, all of us uh, remember uh, focusing primarily on the love story between uh, Keiko and Henry, but there was so much more in that book. Uh, it was so pitch perfect from somebody who grew up here to, to see somebody who was writing about, um, uh, you know, the uh, Rainier School where my father uh, went to elementary school, uh, about uh, Lake, uh, Lakeview uh, Cemetery where members of my family are buried, about how uh, folks were uh, Asian and Pacific Island, Asian American and Pacific Islanders were redlined onto Beacon Hill and parts of the Central District and the International District where you couldn't live any other places. How people, um, Asian uh, American and Pacific Islanders initially wouldn't be hired at Boeing, but then subsequently when they were hired, they could only rise to a certain level and so many, many more uh, events uh, and characterizations that were so perfect uh, perfectly described and perfectly written. So this is an exploration of the book, uh, an exploration of the events and exploration of perhaps the times uh, that were uh, depicted in that, in that novel. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to our own Commissioner Jonathan Lack, who um, have the pleasure of interviewing uh, uh, Jamie Ford. Oh, and by the way, we'll do our best to uh, field your questions in the chat. So please do ask your questions in the chat and we'll try our best to get to them. Thank you, Commissioner Lack. Uh, thank you, Judge Lum. And I, I do wanna thank the, the Courts and Community Committee um, for uh, helping uh, put this on, but I wanna take a, 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 another opportunity to thank the AAPI judges here in the King County Superior Court, um, Judge Lum, Judge Lee, uh, Judge McKee, uh, Judge Oishi, Judge Chung, Judge Shaw, um, and uh, as a, a Asian American, a judicial officer, I will tell you, um, it's nice to be in a uh, on a bench where there are um, uh, 
judges who have had the same or, or similar life experiences and can, and can appreciate the Amer uh, Asian American experience. And, and so I really appreciate the support of my uh, fellow Asian American uh, judges on the bench for this program. Um, today, we hopefully uh, you've had an opportunity to read The Hell in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, um, a New York Times bestseller by author J.B. Ford, who's joining us today. I will tell you, uh, you know, a month and a half ago, I had this idea. I, I never thought that Mr. Ford would even respond to my Facebook message, let alone agree to do this. Um, and at, at some level, I'm, I'm a complete fanboy here. Um, it's the equivalent of, uh, you know, I, I was telling uh, Mr. Ford earlier that if, uh, you know, we had read uh, Beloved, uh, this is the equivalent of having Toni Morrison talk to us. Um, and uh, so it's just uh, an amazing opportunity. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Jamie before we hear from him. Um, he was born uh, in July of 1968 in Eureka, California, but grew up in Ashland, Oregon, Port Orchard, and of course, Seattle. His father was a Seattle native and is of Chinese ancestry, while Ford's mother is a European. Um, he uh, earned a degree in design from the Art Institute of Seattle and also um, attended Seattle's uh, School of Visual Concepts. Um, uh, He's best known for Hotel on the Corner of Bear and Sweet, but he's got a recent book out that I'm sure he'll take the opportunity to talk to you about as well, um, that explores uh, life in the kind of pre-war Seattle. Um, if you have questions for uh, Jamie, please just put them in the uh, chat box and I'll, I'll share them uh, to Jamie. Uh, that way, uh, if you have questions, we can hear them. Um, I'm just really excited. And, and Jamie, I really just kind of want to turn this over to you. Um, nobody really wants to hear from me. We want to hear from you. So anything <laughs> that you want to start with in terms of the book. And just great thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, just please call me Jamie. Um, I'm sorry, did you, did you say, ask if I wanted to start with the book or start with, I'm sorry, I missed that last part. Whatever you're comfortable <laughs> with, you know, just your, your, your introduction, your start, let's just get to it. Yeah, actually, you know, um, it's just, it's almost a tribulus aside. side. Um, when I knew that I was going to be speaking to you know, members of the court, I... I did a little bit of a deep dive into Seattle's history um, as it relates to the Chinese community and the courts, because I knew there was a, a little intersection and just, just a little story. Um, in 1886, that was when the Chinese community was uh, forcibly removed from Seattle. Uh, the Knights of Labor got together and they voted and they decided that everyone of Chinese, you know, basically the competition had to leave town. And so they, loaded everyone up and herded them down to the dock where there was a ship waiting and the ship was going to take them to San Francisco. And there was uh, a King County judge, a man named Judge Green, who actually interceded and sent down sheriff's deputies um, and also militia to try and stop the expulsion. Um, and he had the, the blessing of the governor at the time. And <laughs> they, they, they herded like 90 Chinese people down to the docks and um, the Knights of Labor basically said they wanted to leave because they asked them and they said, yes, we'd like to leave, which is kind of like uh, a master of a slave asking his slave if, his, if he likes to be a slave. You know, it's, it's sort of like a, you have a captive audience with only one answer is acceptable. Um, and there ended up being a skirmish. There were, I believe, five or six of the organizers, the, basically the protesters who were trying to um, get rid of the Chinese community were actually uh, killed in a skirmish, and I think 15 um, of them were arrested and, and taken before the courts. I couldn't figure out what happened to them later. Um, I'm assuming a, a product of the time, uh, you know, they probably were were handled gently by a jury of their peers. Um, but the courts have always had an active role in the racial complexity and makeup of Seattle. Um, often it's in, you know, it's in it's, it's in the functional <laughs> background of, of, of the city, but it's always been there. So when I was asked to speak to this group, I, I just thought it was uh, a really unique opportunity. So thank you for being here. And I really look forward to your questions. Um, when I wrote this book, and it was 10 plus years ago, I, I really did set out to write uh, a love story because I, I, I'm just kind of wired that way. And I, I like uh, complex family stories. It became a father and son story because that's just how, that's just what happens with authors. We, we just, you know, we prick our fingers and bleed on the page. And this book was definitely kind of a heart transplant for me because there's a lot of, of my own familial stuff in there. But it's also a story of the Japanese internment. It's also a story of race relations. It's, it's all these things, but specifically the internment, I just 
naively assumed that everyone in the country had a, at least a cursory understanding of the Japanese internment because I grew up in the area and we have an institutional knowledge of the internment because it affected people in our community. I went on my first book tour and I'm, I'm not kidding. I went to Chicago and I did a book event and a woman came up to me and she said she was a, a retired high school history teacher and she never knew of the internment. Um, and so there was just this gap in our history where there was a moratorium wasn't in our history books. It, it often wasn't discussed in Japanese American homes. There was just this wall of silence from every angle. And so um, while I set out to write a love story, it became something more and for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Now there's, you know, high schools in, I was invited to speak to high schools in Switzerland who are, are reading the book. And so this, this, this very American story um, is, is becoming more widely known. Also, there's just a wonderful book out now if anyone, um, you know, wants <laughs> further study as well as just educational entertainment edification, uh, Facing the Mountain by Daniel James Brown is out now. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm about halfway through it and it's a terrific book. Jamie, one of the reasons I thought the book was appropriate now is because kind of the response to COVID and the racism that's going around with the Asian community. Um, and, you know, I think I told you this is the third time I've read the book. Um, and it, it just uh, brought it, uh, I think, the current crisis to, to mind for me and the parallels were similar. And I was wondering if you could kind of address those issues. Oh, you know, I, I try to be... I try to, I try to lean into the optimistic side of my nature. I could lean hard in the other direction. Um, you know, I've, I've seen this from a couple different angles. Um, my father, uh, he went to Garfield. Um, my father worked in a Chinese restaurant. Um, my dad also taught martial arts. And when I was, I must have been about five, my family went to Seattle. I'm, I'm sorry, I went to Portland for my sister's 16th birthday. And at a gas station, um, a couple, two guys harassed my dad and were calling him a chink. And my dad broke one guy's arm and another guy's leg. And so I had this weird memory of sitting on the police station steps at night with my mom waiting for my dad to come out. And he came out and you know, there were no charges pressed against him because it was self-defense. And he ended up getting a part-time job teaching self-defense to uh, state patrol police officers because of that incident. And so these kind of moments have always been with us. We're just like everything, we're seeing them now because of, you know, everyone has one of these in their pockets. Um, and with COVID, with it, you know, the person who was occupying the White House at the time and just kind of the, I call them Craven lick spittles, the politicians that will, you know, they become, you know, the demagogues to constituents who don't know what demagoguery is, where they just blame the other. And in the midst of that, there's just a lot of people that get caught up in that and they have, feel like they have license to be vocally abusive, physically abusive, to discriminate, all these things. Um, even Seattle, you know, Seattle, I think it was, they tried to pass their version of the Equal Housing Act, like in 1962, and Seattle voters shot it down. So Seattle was way behind the times, um, and they didn't you know, jump on board until the Civil Rights Act in, in 67 and 68, and its enforcement, which went vaguely enforced until the 90s. Um, and so this stuff has always been there, and it's... I look at my children and they grew up in a school environment for the most part um, where people don't care anymore who you are or, or there's, there's much more acceptance. And I think we're gonna see that in media. We're gonna see, you know, just when the Oscars did away with one third of their voting board members and brought in people of color and suddenly we're realizing that there's all these other stories from uh, filmmakers of color from all over the world. And it's it's kind of this, this renaissance of culture, which that's me leaning into the positive. So I think there's, I think there's good things ahead of us. I, th I just, I try to tell myself that these are growing pains and we don't move quickly as someone that studies history, 
as much as I want the world to just snap and turn and wake up, we don't do it. It takes like a generation and a half to make any change of lasting consequence. Um, and so, you know, we're planting, we're planting seeds in the garden that we won't get to walk through, but our children will, and hopefully it'll be a beautiful place. Along those lines, you know, Henry, uh, the, the button, I think actually is how your, the story really started uh, with your short story about the button. Um, and I, I've had friends who are Asian American and uh, have been harassed at grocery stores. And we've had, uh, you know, a couple of major assaults here in King County uh, in Washington. Um, uh, and uh, the, the victims have, for the most part, actually not been Chinese. Uh, but have been Vietnamese, have been uh, Japanese, and whatnot. And, and I, I think, you know, uh, at least we're to the point where we don't have people in the Asian community wearing buttons say, I am not Chinese, um, you know, in response to the, the, the COVID racism. And so I guess I have that uh, optimism too. Um, though in the, in the most recent version of the book, you kind of give us an extra chapter about uh, an experience that Keiko has um, uh, with the swans. Um, and Ms. Mahan's uh, response to uh, Keiko saying, well, I didn't do it, um, and Ms. Mahan scolds her anyway, uh, in, essentially uh, for, for uh, witnessing the, the bad act and not doing anything about it. Um, and I guess, you know, can you address that in the context of the current uh, uh, Asian racism? Do we need Ms. Mahan out there uh, uh, telling us all to stand up? You know, <sighs> We do, and there, there are, as you know, the the, the dark stories make the news. Um, the the moments of light, you know, they they kind of uh, get they pass unnoticed. Um, during the Standing Rock event, I, I had friends here in Montana who uh, were friends. Uh, friends, Quakers, and they went on a big aid mission and they brought tons of stuff um, to Standing Rock, medical supplies and things like that, and food and water and warm clothes and things like that. And, and there's always been, there's been good people in these moments of chaos and darkness. There's been allies, there's been people who are very supportive. And I, I try to remind myself that that's our nature too. That like we're burdened with some really unkind people who are lacking in emotion and uh, uh, compassion. I, as a writer, sometimes I, I think of myself as someone in the compassion creation business, and there's a deficit. There's always going to be a little deficit. And I think as a writer, if I can create something that I can inject into the bloodstream of our society, it can help inoculate against, against racism and prejudice and sexism and homophobia. And the things that, that just burden us and keep us from moving forward, um, Man, the, the that short story, I people had I'd written hotel and people really wanted um, Keiko's point of view, and I, I never tell this. You know, it's always Henry's point of view, and we never see the story through through Keiko's eyes. And so I wanted to take that opportunity and tell that story. But that's also, um, you know, that that particular woman who's central in that story, um, a, a gentleman named Ots Kiyuchi, who was. 12 at the time of Pearl Harbor, Seattle native. Um, you know, he he went to Bailey Gatzert's and he remembers her and he he's the one that's, that really, that his stories brought that character to life. So um, I think in this moment, especially on a month where we're talking about, you know, Asian uh, Pacific Islander awareness and heritage, there's so many great stories that haven't been told. And I think we're gonna get this, this renaissance of story. Instead of recycling the Fast and the Furious 12 and 13 and 14, we're gonna get better stories. And we're gonna get other people's stories. And I think all of those things are empathy enlarging experiences. So that's, that's kind of why I'm hopeful. Um one of the things that we have to deal with as lawyers and judicial officers and people working with court is oftentimes it's hard understanding why people don't tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he certainly Henry doesn't want to talk about his story. He, he doesn't tell his stories to his, his, his father and his mother uh, through this. Um, uh, frankly, his relationship with his son is that until, you know, he's in his sixties, he doesn't really talk to his son about uh, his history. And, we as judicial officers and, and people in the court often have to figure out why people aren't telling us 
um, things. And and I thought your book really kind of addressed the genesis of that. But I'm I'm wondering if you can kind of delve a little deeper in this. And before you answer that, just a reminder, folks, if you have questions, I'm not the only one asking questions here. <laughs> uh, please post them in the chat, and I'll I'll share them with Jamie. Um, uh, don't let me dominate this. I'm sure everybody has actually better questions than I do. But on, on the why why don't we tell our story? Hmm. Um. It, it may be a blanket generalization, but it may be a, a culture. Uh, it, part of it may be cultural, where um, it's less about us, more about our family, more about our parents. Um, as we come, generations become more American, perhaps we adopt that you know unique, rugged individualism and the spotlight moves from a familial spotlight to a central spotlight and we begin to tell the stories. I think, this is my personal opinion, um, every family has hardships and many of those hardships become secrets. And those hardships may deal with, uh, you know, loss and exclusion and, you know, moments of perceived internalized shame. And so children pick up on the social cues of their parents and their elders. And if their parents don't talk about it, the kids won't ask. Um, and so I think, you know, families that have a, a harder journey, they internalize more of these secrets. And then the stories just don't get told. But I think we're finally reaching a moment where people are comfortable telling their stories. Even, even uh, uh, Otz, who I mentioned, Otz Kiyuchi, he didn't talk about the internment at all until the reparations in the 80s. And then as he said, before that, I wouldn't talk about it. Afterwards, you couldn't shut me up. And so I think there's that moment where people feel it's okay to talk and their children are asking questions. And so that, that combination of the two things, that confluence of those moments, then those stories come to light. Um, even, in, even in my own family, I'm mean, like, there's just, there's still stuff I'm learning like now in my fifties about my family that I had no idea. Um, and it's, and I'm not alone. I think, I think everyone's families have, you know, have something like that happening. P part of what, what uh, I think motivates and stimulates the next generation is just having <laughs> like diversity uh, centers on campuses and things like that, places where that uniqueness is celebrated and can be enjoyed and partaken by people outside of that culture. And then that uniqueness isn't marginalized, it's just the bonus of being you. I remember when I went to Seattle University, I remember walking across campus one day, there's this big green, you know, basically a, a, a parkland, a field. And I'm, I'm over here and there's another guy over here. And we sort of, we, we looked at each other and we were very similar, we vectored in the middle. And he was, I'm half Chinese, he's half Korean. And we just looked at each other and we both were just like, right, right? Like what, right? Like we're, we're the same. And they're really, you know, now schools, even high schools will have a, a, a diversity officer or someone like that, that, that their job is to make, um, you know, people who are outside of the, the, the mean average, whatever that is, feel included and comfortable and able to, to share their unique perspectives. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was asked to give a talk at, oh, where was it? Central Michigan University and they had just opened their diversity center. And so they hosted me at a reception there and I, I went there and I met with their, their, their new director of diversity and they were, um, they were, they were queer, they were black. Uh, very strident woman, charming and I loved her. And we're having this conversation in the diversity center and a young white student comes up and he says, yeah, this is great, but why don't white people have a, a center for, for them? And she turns to him and says, and I quote, it's called a frat house, motherfucker. You've had it for 200 years. <laughs> and she's kind of right. There's always been a space for, you know, the mean average of, uh, of America, which has been, you know, Eurocentric uh, Caucasian. And now that people are holding space for other people to not only feel comfortable in their own skin, but to share their stories with other people. I think that's, that's just such a great leap forward. Um, 
We're getting some questions in chat. Not in a Maoist oh, way, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. please. Absolutely. We're getting some questions in the chat. Um, so the first one is, are you planning to stick with historical fiction? Uh, would you set a book in modern times as part of your commitment to creating empathy? Yeah, actually, I, I have a new book with my editor, and I'm supposed to get my edits back um, any day now. Yeah, I, I'm supposed to get them back like last week, so they should show up in my inbox. Um, the new book is, it's a, I call it my big box of crayons, because my, my previous three books are all set in Seattle, and um, I, I wanted to write three books with a beating heart in Seattle, but this book is much larger, and so it goes from about 1832 to 2045, so it's historical and it's speculative. It jumps into the future a little bit, and it takes, in part of it is set in Seattle in around 2013, so it is almost contemporary, and the part is set in San Francisco and Baltimore and China and London. Um, it jumps all over the place. It's a, it's a much bigger book for me, and it's a much more complex book for me. And so it, it still does the things that I like to do um, when I write. It's just a, a bigger canvas. Um, and it I, I found the contemporary chapters that I was writing really fun and dare I say easier to write because there's less research <laughs> involved when I'm writing about 1832. It's a lot of research just to make sure I get everything, um, you know, create that verisimilitude that, that makes it work. Um, with the contemporary writing, there's, there's really important stories that are just in the wake of where we were that really reflect an echo of what's just ahead. And so um, I think the next book I'm going to write I've been researching another project after this one will be, much of it will be contemporary. Um, and not just because I think it's easier to write, it's just, that's just kind of where my, my heart is pointing me towards a, towards a story there. All right. Um, you seem to have more positive perspective of race, especially Asian, Asian relations than others that have recently spoken on the topic. What's your source of your optimism? I lived in Hawaii for six years. <laughs> I, I, um, I, and there's problems in Hawaii too. Don't get me wrong. There's problems in Hawaii. Um, but I, I have a friend named Kip Fulbeck and he's a wonderful uh, teacher, uh, a poet, uh, photographer. He has a book called, um, uh, 100% Hapa. And he started doing these, these pictorial books about, about race and, uh, mixed race people started out with books of, of of half Asian people, happy people, and then his later books have been. He'll he'll put out a, a call. He'll say, "I'm going to be in L.A. or San Francisco, Dallas, New York, and I'm in mean, all mixed race people come and I'll photograph you, and you might be part of my book." And so we'll have people that are you know Persian and Jewish and Navajo, like combinations you would never you know imagine, and he he does these these shoots, he'll say, I'm going to be in San Francisco and I'll be there for three days. And those three days will book in 20 minutes. It'll just fill up. And then he tried to do it in Hawaii and he like couldn't hardly get anyone to come to the shoot because they're like, what's the big deal? We're all sort of everything anyway now. And so I, I, I hope, and I, sometimes I look to Hawaii and I think maybe that's our future where we're so diversified that you can't identify anyone enough to hate them. You know what I mean? It sounds so silly, but, um, and part of that comes from, 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 you know, going to school with people, falling in love with people, having kids. And then it's, it's, you know, you, you, there's all these, probably everyone knows someone who has a family member that's like, either they, you, you would, peg them as the most homophobic person in you know this family and then the granddaughter or grandson comes out as as queer trans whatever and suddenly everyone is shocked that you know uncle whatever is so loving and accepting and supporting and it's just a different game when it's when people get to know people and they stop being the other and they start being part of all of us and so don't get me wrong there are days where i'm just bummed and I'm angry and I want to punch people. Um, there's enough of my dad in me that I'm just like, 
gosh, every time I hear about some poor Asian woman being accosted on the streets of New York, I'm just like, why couldn't that be my dad? My dad would just beat that guy down. Um, so there is that part of me that that knows what turns Mr. Hand into Mr. Fist. Like, I, I, I feel that. Um, but I sleep better if I try to pretend that we're at least that we are marching towards uh, a more equitable world. Hope. Um, and, and, you know, I, I certainly appreciate your, your discussion about, how, how, you know, Hawaiian, uh, you know, the Asian Americans in Hawaii, my, that's where my, my uh, Japanese family comes from, Hawaii as well, and I, I'm Hapa, and I will tell you that I, I had to deal with that, um, the, the issue of not being white, not being Asian enough, um, you know, and, and, and that struggle, and, and I think at, at some level, you know, Henry deals with that too, um, you know, he's, he's the Asian kid at the white school, so He's too white for the Asian kids, and he's too 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 Asian for the for the white kids, and he, he doesn't really fit in. And and my, my guess is at some level being a, you know a, a Hapa as well. And you know even recently I've had to struggle with is the word Hapa something that I should be using? Um, so there's a discussion in Hawaii about you know is it really a racist term that divides us? And you know in my mind it's just what my mother referred to me as you know her little Hapa kid. Um, one of the questions uh, in, the, in the chat is, Mr. Ford, in your journey uh, of writing, did you uh, have a hard time narrowing your storyline when you likely heard so many amazing stories, um, or did they inspire future stories? I mean, my guess is you interviewed hundreds of people for this book, and, and, and you know, the, their stories are in this book. How did you, how did you narrow it down? Oh, um, I, <laughs> I can only be an expert on my own experience, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll get asked, like I was asked to speak at Yukon years ago um, regarding Asian American history. And I'm there with people who have PhDs in Asian American history. And, and I just, I was just felt like I was so out of my depth, but, but I can be an expert on my narrow familial experience of having a, a, a Caucasian mother and a, a Chinese father who speaks Cantonese and works in a Chinese restaurant. I mean, that's that's my that's my life, and I can speak about that. Same with Amy Tan. I know the people that are there are people in the Chinese American community who, who have criticized Amy Tan, but that that's her, you know she's very much telling her mother's story, and so that's that's where she's from. That's what she knows. Um, as boy, I sort of vectored off what the real question was there. Sorry about that. I was going to repeat the question. And, and I think that's the point of the question. How did you oh, oh, keep oh. it focused? You know, how did you, how, how did you uh, take all these different stories? And, and I know at, at some level, when I'm reading the book, I, I think you are Marty, and I think your father at mm -hmm. some level um, is Henry. Um, uh, you know, and that's just an assumption in my head. But there's all these uh, very, very vibrant characters. Um, and uh, you know, how did you you, you when researching the book and getting it into writing it, my guess is there were all these other characters that could have come in there. How, how did you choose these specific characters and how did you keep focus? Um, there were there were a lot of characters. Um, I didn't do a ton of interviewing. I, I did do some. Um, what was super helpful and instructional, and it's just important to have the oral history recorded, is all the work that Tom Maketa has done with Din Show. Uh, it's probably 300, uh, you know, recorded interviews now. Um, and so I joined Den Show. Um, I went to Minidoka. I, I, I did a lot of research at, at the wing um, just to validate a lot of my assumptions and many, many of them were, were wrong. So I, I needed to, to try and, you know, if I'm writing about the French Revolution, there's no one walking around whose parents were put beneath the, you know, the guillotine, but um, there are still people among us who spent their, their early years of their childhood in internment camps and their parents went to those camps and their parents lost everything. And so I, I wanted to write with a sense of historical and personal reverence. Um, but as far as focusing on, on narrowing the story, I, I realized what I've done. Um, I, I, I heard a quote from, from Bruce Springsteen and I'm, I'm, I'm butchering what he said, but he basically said the people that, you know, that didn't give us enough love or acceptance or support or time or whatever in our youth, we grow up and we emulate them. And he did that 
with his own father. And I, I did that with my own dad. And so when I write in trying to find my voice, I found my voice in my dad's voice, um, the voice that couldn't be heard when he was young because no one would listen. Um, and so unconsciously, I think that that's, that's what I did. And I think that's what a lot of writers do is um, if we're writing something that really comes from a, a deep personal place, um, you're almost channeling your, your parents sometimes. Um, and I, I didn't set out to do that, but that's just kind of, you know, I'm sure Dr. Phil will have some, you know, <laughs> more detailed explanation of how this phenomena happens. But, but I did, I think when I, when I was looking for my voice as a writer, I found it in uh, my father who has been gone for 20 years now. One of the um, things is as, as legal writers, we often start at point A and, and uh, we, you know, when I write, I go point A, point B, point C, okay, now I'm at the, at the end. Um, clearly this record is a very, very important part of the story. Um, and in my mind, uh, your exploration of kind of the music history of Seattle, which I think is greatly underappreciated and underknown. Um, I, you know, it, it's not just, you know, Kurt Cobain and Jimmy Hendrix. There's a substantial amount of music history in Seattle, um, in large part uh, in connection with the second great creation after World War II. But um, when you started the book, you know, after you got your short story, when you were starting, you know, really to talk about a full book, uh, was the record there? Was the jazz tree there? Um, did you anticipate the, the record being at the end and, 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 and bringing everybody together or it just kind of let itself there? Um, <laughs> the, you know, it, I think it, it probably started with the character of Sheldon and some, it's interesting people, and usually they're, they're Caucasian people will ask like, why, why do you have jazz? Why do you have Sheldon? And my answer is always because jazz was there. That if I if I recreated the neighborhood in fiction without that component, it would have rang false. Um, I remember walking down South Jackson with my my grandfather, my yeah, and he'd be like, "Oh yeah, Cab Calloway played there, and Ella Fitzgerald played there," and that was the music of his generation. And again, because of redlining, because of housing covenants, I and mean, all the things that conspired to push people of color into certain neighborhoods, uh, whether it's Beacon Hill or Central District, it, it, you know, all the people of color within the city sort of lived in this close proximity. And so you not only are they living together, but there is a cultural and artistic spillover. There's a cross pollinization that I think is amazing because I think that's the one thing that, um, that really breaks down a lot of barriers is art and, and, and food and, and to some degree sports and things like that. Um, and so that was just there. As far as the record, I had always gone to Bud's Jazz Records, which is, I, I, it breaks my heart that right before the book was published, Bud's closed. Um, but I used to go there and get like Nina Simone records. And it was just, I always felt like I was going someplace really cooler and more interesting than I actually had a right to participate in, you know? I mean, it's just, just like the sort of basement walk down stairs and um, it's just downtown Seattle always had kind of this really busy pre-gentrified vibe. You went down into Bud's and it was like this, uh, <laughs> it was just the, the jazz resistance was down there. Um, and I also, I just liked being there because that was like the music my dad listened to. And I wasn't such a jazz fan myself, but um, it eased the the burden of, mi of missing my grandfather and stuff like that is to go and, and enjoy that music. I remember when I, the last time I went to Bud's was Random House sent me to Seattle with a photographer to go around and, and shoot photos at locations. And we went down, um, down into Bud's and uh, the guy <laughs> behind the counter, I come in with a photographer and we're starting, you know, he starts looking around to take photos and he's like, what's this about? Um, and I explained like I'd written a book and he's like, no, no, no. Is this for good or is this for evil? I said, it's for good. He's like, carry on. Then that was Bud's jazz records. You know, there was just kind of a magic there. So the record really came. I, um, I, uh, I live in West Seattle and last night I was walking my dogs. I live right last the junction, literally a block from easy street records. And I want to tell you last night I did go into easy street records and I looked to see if 
um, I could find uh, Dr. Holden's uh, uh, <laughs> record there uh, under H. Uh, I was not successful. Um, one of the things that is concerning to me about um, kind of ethnic and racial um, books that become widespread is that um, other people outside of our community will read that one book and then say, oh, this is kind of the stereotypical um, behavior of a, a Chinese father or a Chinese mother. And these are the traditions that that community has. And I know the way to deal with that is to get more books there that have different perspectives of what life in, in, in you know, different cultures means. And, and I guess, um, did you have any fear that like people would take the book and then think that these are the stereotypes of, of uh, certain communities? Um, this is, this, this may seem like an irresponsible answer, but no, I, I didn't. I, I, cause I didn't think anybody would read this book. <laughs> I thought it'd be read by my family and that was it. Like I thought, okay, some of my family members, like I, it's funny people, people have asked like, you know, it's told through the Chinese, through, through the lens of a Chinese boy, but it's very much a Japanese American story. And honestly, I was scared to write a Chinese American story because I have aunties that would tell me if I got anything wrong, they would hold me accountable. Like these are the aunties where I show up at Thanksgiving, they're like, you got fat. I'm like, thank you, I appreciate that. That's honesty. Um, and so I kind of, I was in, I was, I wrote in fear of getting certain things wrong. And um, I figured I could, I could see this this Japanese American story, but through a Chinese American lens. And I felt like that was a, a respectable narrative distance where it could be. And that's how I felt as I, you know, I, I had a certain amount of knowledge, but I'm doing a deep dive and I'm going to learn new things along the way. Um, as far as worrying about it being, um, you know, perpetuating stereotypes and things like that. Um, once the book kind of blew up, then I did start to worry about that. Um, but I, you know, I can only do, I'm, I can only be a product of, of my time and, and do the best I can. I can't predict the social norms, of, you know, 20 years, 30 years from now. Um, and I, but I, but, but just having that awareness goes into my, my other writing. Um, the new book that I'm, that's with my editor, it has six time periods. And we go from, a, from 1882, where there is a very, uh, um, a woman named Akwang Moy, who was the first Chinese woman to ever set foot in America. And she was put on display and, and people would come see her for her otherness because she had bound feet and things like that. And to go from that time period and move away from the stereotype to where we're in a contemporary setting where it really, you know, it's, it's not a factor or less of a factor to a future setting where it's not even a thought that, you know, there's, there's, there's a different thing going on in our culture by that point where people aren't, you know, people are no longer saying like, like my daughter, she's Filipino and she just graduated from college in Kansas and she would have people, you know, the people are like, where are you from? And she's like, I'm from Montana. No, really, where are you from? Oh, I'm Filipino American. And like, wow, you speak amazing, amazing English, you know, those kind of things. And in the future, I don't think that's going to happen as much. You know, it doesn't, doesn't happen in Hawaii um, and places that are super diverse. Um, and so I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm aware of that stereotype, but, but I'm also aware of people that can use as a, as a cudgel against each other, even within our own community. Um, Frank Chin, the playwright, um, I mean, he was the biggest critic of Amy Tan to the point of it just being crazy. Like, and, and Frank got so linear in here, like, this is what we ate on Sunday. And that's, you know, his unique perspective, he had determined that's what everyone did. And so if Amy Tan's was different, she's a com completely 100% wrong. And, and starts, you know, lobbying these bombs and missiles at one another. And I just think that's really unhelpful. And so I try to, you know, I try to operate and allow myself to have a little bit of room to operate and 
give other people that room to operate. It's different if it's someone outside of that culture that's telling that story. I'm, I'm not a big fan of telling everyone to stay in your lanes and write only what you know. I really think if you can jump into someone else's circumstances and tell that story so well that people in that community embrace you, then you've done this incredible act of empathy. But if you get it wrong, you, you deserve to pay a price for that. Um, and so um, I, I try to give myself space, give other people space and not be too critical unless it's someone that's just really exploiting another culture for monetary gain. And then those people, you know, they deserve all the, all the criticism that, uh, that they've earned along the way. My guess is when you were working with your editors, you really went through the use of every word in this book. And um, there is a point in the book where I am actually shocked and, and I'm uh, made uncomfortable. And I wanna know how you address um, this as an author. Um, uh, when when Henry and Sheldon um, have the interaction with Chaz, and Chaz uh, calls um, mm. Henry ice N word, um, as a, an Asian American author using the N word, uh, you know what was the discussion um, about whether or not to use it, not to use it? Um, you know, was it appropriate? Was it not appropriate? You know what what was those conversations that you had internally, and then with your editor as well? This is, this is just me. Um, with my editor, she just trusted me on this one because um, my name's on the book and her name's not on the book. So I'm going to get the slings and arrows and she's not. If, if we're writing historical stuff, I, I think it's appropriate to use to contextualize language. Um, not if it were just like hammering it for nauseating effect, but I use it once in a very appropriate context. And if you sort of extract the historical reality from all those moments, then you're, you're, you're the, the opposite side of the coin of people who want to ban books like Tom Sawyer, um, like, or um, Diary of Anne Frank, you know, it, it's, it's unhelpful. It, it may be super potently politically correct, but it, it, you sort of bleed the reality out of the story. And that's not why I wrote the story. And so, for me, I'm I'm pretty careful and judicious in how I do that. Like I don't swear a lot in my books. I do in this new book. I, I do because it makes sense in the context. But I think in a book you can easily say, instead of saying Bob said fuck, you can just say Bob swore, and the 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 reader gets it. Unless you're doing it for some sort of like you know percussive effect, and then there's a reason. And I think sometimes using racist language. It's, it has a, a percussive effect. It's not put in there to perpetuate the use of that word. It's not put in there to validate the use of the word. And I think because it's in a historical context and that context is based in you know, a historical reality, then it makes sense. And so it's, it's just something you have to kind of have to tread carefully with. Um, but it's like a couple of years ago, I visited a high school in Texas and was called a chink and I would not want to write about that and say, I was called a C word. I'm like, there's a percussive effect when I tell people, yes, in this day and age, kids called me a chink. Like that's what's going on. And um, and it just, I just think it has to be handled um, with a bit of forethought and understanding that certain words have a painful context for people. And, um, and so you should respect that a little bit. No, but you should. You know, for me, when I read it, I read it twice. I read it. Okay, what was Henry hearing when that was said? Um, and he, in my mind, he heard it, he heard the rice issue. And but what did Sheldon hear? And and so in my mind, it was really a function of uh, us as the reader uh, being placed in the emotional place of the character in the book. And so um, you know, that's how I ended up reconciling it, but it really, you know, in the context of 2021, I really had to think about it. And, and frankly, I, I appreciated the, 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 your answer. Um, uh, one of the, the, one of the, I think, vivid things in the book is when we're at Camp Harmony and we realize that these people are uh, being essentially all, uh, uh, housed in horse stalls and in, in, in chicken coops. I actually 
unaware of Camp Harmony until I was walking around the Puyallup uh, fairgrounds. And um, I, uh, how did you get a feel for the the actual um, emotional status of of, of of your characters when they were going through this these events? I, I was the same. I, you know, I had a, a very broad understanding of the internment, but it wasn't very deep. And it wasn't until I was writing this book that I realized Puyallup, the Puyallup Fairgrounds was once Camp Harmony. I, you know, I, I, I'd done the Puyallup a gazillion times. I rode the scary roller coaster and ate the scones and did all the things. I had no idea. And that, just the fact that I had no idea was shocking. Um, fortunately, there was a pretty good photographic record. Um, I mean, and there's a lot of photos that just, around the time that I was writing the book, a bunch of photos had just come out of, you know, there was an embargo on a lot of photos that Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams had taken. And then the government clamped down on all of those and those were not released to the public. And even the photos that, like, if you just, if you, if you have enough of a, a sense of the context, the photos that were released in like Life Magazine are like propaganda photos. You know, it's like photos of, you know, prisoners in North Korea where they're smiling and they're being well fed um, when the Red Cross visits, you know, it's that kind of thing. Um, but if you read people's, um, and, and through the Wing Luke, I was able to look at, um, you know, letters and writings from people in camp and their personal experiences really um, make these things come to life. I mean, it's, it's, it's different to see like, a, you know, this happened there, but if it's through the eyes of someone, if it's in their words of talking about in the stall and the only showers where the stalls used to spray down the horses, um, that kind of stuff, you, and that's, that's why the oral tradition is so important that these stories are told to someone who's going to record them. That's, you know, den shows, I mean, they're, they're amazing. Um, but even in families, and I think every family has a story and, and people, when I, when I visit high schools especially, and probably one out of a thousand kids do it, but I, I take a moment where I tell the kids, please interview your parents, interview your grandparents, just ask them the, and I try to give them a context, ask them what, you know, their happiest moment of their childhood, their most embarrassing moment, their most fearful moment, you know, these, their relation to their parents and things like that. And occasionally those stories will come out and it's, and every family has those stories. And I think it's, I think it's important that we remember them. Um, it helps us understand ourselves. And so places like, like the, the Puyallup, um, we, we've just, we pave over our history. Um, just, we just do it as a society. When they tore up the, the pavement in the ID to put down the light rail tracks, they tore it up and they found rails that we had paved over from you know the 20s um, that they didn't even know were there. And so I think we do that writ large with all of our history, but especially the history that it makes us uncomfortable, that's embarrassing to us as a, as a government, as a people. And it's usually the stuff that affects you know, the marginalized people in our society um, and not just people of color, to women. Um, I mean, there's, it's his story. It's it's not her story. There's so many, uh, so many stories that are just completely lost to us. And so um, I'm all about making space or stepping out of the way and, and letting those stories come to light. Speaking of stories that um, uh, could potentially be lost to us, um, uh, I don't want this to to end for the people of the court system that are watching uh, this chat. Um, you wrote another book with another Constellation Prizes, which uh, has a star uh, with a, a true story. Um, I, could, could you pitch that book to everybody else? Because I've read it. Um, I want everybody else to read it. So I, I want you to take a couple of seconds to pitch that book. Sure. And, and, and I will, I'll take a couple seconds to pitch that one, then I'll pitch and, pitch and, and even but I think it's a more interesting one too. Um, I wrote Love and Other Constellation Prizes because I was fascinated with the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. It was the Seattle World's Fair before the 62 World's Fair that gave us the Space Needle. And at that expo in, in 1909, they had themed days. And so on uh, Agriculture Day, 
they gave away a cow. Every day they had a theme and a prize. And so on mining day, they gave away 3,000 copper ingots. And on September 15th, 1909 was Washington Children's Day and they gave away a child. And his name was Ernest and he was donated by the Washington Children's Receiving Home. And I was fascinated with that. I was also fascinated with the casualness with which that was discussed. Um, it, when I say it now, it, we're sort of taken aback, but in context of the time, it was like, oh, and they're giving away a kid on Thursday and tomorrow the elephants arrive. And it, <laughs> I just had to know more about the Seattle at that time. And it became this other story um, you know, about prohibition and the red light district and real historical characters, um, you know, like the, the mayor at the time, uh, the police chief at the time who supported um, the, the, the red light district, the sex industry there. Um, but another story that I, I was very, another book I was grateful to be included is um, a collection that just came out last year. It's called Stories from Suffragette City. And it's a collection of interconnected stories um, all set on the same day of the grand women's suffragette movement in New York City. And, but, you know, 100 years ago, very important historical moment. And I was, I was really honored as a person, as a guy, to be invited to submit a story to that. I think they're myself and Chris Bojalian and uh, were in, invited to, to join this really impressive group of just incredible writers. Um, and so I um, wrote a story about a, a Chinese suffragette based in New York. Um, people forget that there, there were people of color, um, not just Ida B. Wells, um, there were Asian suffragettes fighting for the right to vote, even though they couldn't vote until the 50s because they couldn't become US citizens. And so um, I have a story in there that I'm, 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 I'm really happy with. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I could say proud, that's, that's proud. I feel weird saying that, but, um, but I'm, just, I'm very happy with how, how it turned out. I learned a lot and um, it's been a really well-reviewed book and just reading the book for me and reading everyone else's stories, I think it's, um, it was a real good journey. Could, could you share the name of the book again? Sure, it's called Stories from Suffragette City. And there's a plug in the question and answer for a song uh, of Willow Frost, which is also oh, yeah. a, a best song that you wrote. Um, but I guess, you know, the next question that I have, almost to wrap this up, is, um, uh, and, and you had mentioned the Oscars, the, the Oscar panels, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a third of the folks that vote in the Oscars are being changed to people of color. Um, you know, I don't think Americans read much anymore. Um, uh, we are uh, bound by our Netflix subscription. And so my question is, when is, um, when am I have the opportunity to see Henry on the big screen? Henry Hickel on the big screen. Oh, um, I had really high hopes until COVID hit and that shut down everything. Um, yeah, there's really good producers attached. There's a director attached. Uh, there was a screenwriter who had written a script. They've since moved on to another screenwriter, which happens with with films. You know, they'll go through ten screenwriters. I, I hope not. I hope they don't. But that's kind of how Hollywood works. Um, I really don't know. I I'm I'm up and down. It's like one month. I'm like, this is going to happen. The next month, I'm like, I just don't want to think about it anymore because the the process is so uh inconsistent um george decay is an executive producer that was wonderful to have uncle george on board um you know i think this, the producers hope to have a new screenplay written by the end of summer and then hope to package it and be shooting you know next spring next summer um but i think they've said that the last couple of years so i don't know what to say anymore there's been so much interest in it but because my main characters are Asian, you know, are Asian children and not Tom Cruise or Angelina Jolie, it's hard for them to, like Tom Cruise, they can just, Tom Cruise in a movie to be named and written and it'll get $30 million in financing. Um, with this particular story, it's gonna take a special group of people that are super passionate in having the story told. And I, 
I'm pretty sure I have those people uh, that this, that Henry and Keiko are in the hands of those people, but they're within, you know, a, a Hollywood apparatus that doesn't crank out a lot of um, Asian American stories. So um, I'm I'm muting my frustration because I, I, I <laughs> um, I'm well, really I certainly look for it. it. When the movie comes out, I'm going to extend a, uh, an invitation for you to come back and, and, and brief us on it if, if you're. Um, and there was something in the chat that says um, it's like with the person you talked to at Buzz Buds, yeah. was a guy by the name of James Rasmus, yeah. who was a great jazz trumpeter in his own right and a Franklin High School alumni. Absolutely. So, um, Mr. Ford, thank you so much for joining us today um, and sharing um, Henry and Keiko. Uh, it's just an, an amazing story. I, I, I you know, I, like I read it for the third time and I had to set it down because I'm crying. Um, I'm, I, I see my mother in this. I see my grandparents in it. I see my aunts and uncles. I have a, a uncle who's in the 442nd um, and and uh, he, he, he reads like uh, Keiko's father. Um, this book just reads true to me. And I hope it reads true to the other folks. And I just, uh, we're out of time. I think we could go on for her, but I really appreciate you uh, responding literally in 15 minutes to my, my, <laughs> my message. And then really two minutes later saying yes. And um, it, it's a commitment to your commitment to the community. Uh, and and I, I look forward to your next books. Um, thank you all so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye.